morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great of you to join us and welcome also to the people who are watching online at home. Um, I think the way we're going to run this is to have essentially some of a conversation for about 40 minutes and then throw it open to questions from here, but also for people who are watching online. And I gather there's instructions to people who are doing that um, so that you know how to put questions in as well. Uh, my name is Sally Morgan. I'm master at Fitzwilliam College. And my relevance, I guess, today is that I did the Blair years in Downing Street um, and I've been a member of the Lords for 20 years. I am absolutely delighted to be here with Roger, who... I've sort of known on and off the, over the years, but frankly has become a very good friend too in Cambridge. He's obviously now, and has been for, for, for how many years, Roger? Nine. Nine years, master at Selwyn College, but had a very long and distinguished career in BBC News. He truly was a titan. We'd, we, all, we all sort of revered Roger, I think. In his book, and if you haven't seen it, here it is, um, he's challenging us to think, I think, why does public service broadcasting, especially news, matter? What's gone wrong, if it has? What has to change to build or rebuild trust in BBC News? And how do we work better in a world with social media? So for me, they were the very significant questions that came through, but there's a very strong theme too of what is impartiality and what is balance and what's the difference, which I think is really interesting. Um, but I think over to you, Roger, to, to introduce introduce your, your book and then we'll, we'll have some questions. Well, first of all, thanks to so many people being here today. Um, a very distinguished audience. I see at least one former editor of Channel 4 News here. Oh. And um, also I'm thrilled that Sally was going to do this because actually I think that interface between broadcasting and media and politics right. is incredibly important. And um, this actually, uh, the book actually comes from a number of Cambridge inputs. So it first surfaced as uh, a talk that I did for Selwyn called 10 Things to Make the News Better. And then everyone joined in and it then grew in its number. And we also did a Cambridge in America event at UCLA uh, with BAFTA as well, where we put a particular American context on it in the era of Trump. And I suppose I start from the principle um, that public service broadcasting is a good thing that most people think is a good thing as a place where we can all come together. And obviously in the week where we watch the royal funeral, it's public service broadcasting that brings the whole country together. And in normal times, it's a place where you can get news that's impartial and accurate and fair. And if you look at the polling evidence, pretty much everyone agrees with that. So something like 93% of the country want there to be impartial news. And that's even in the high 80s for 16 to 24s, who are notoriously difficult to impress. Um, <laughs> so the, the context, though, is that Clearly, public service broadcasting is under siege from a whole variety of sources. And in the wider world, um, there's fake news, there's disinformation, there are bad state actors. If you look at the moment what's happening in Russia, most obviously, but also in China and plenty of other places. And then there's what we do to ourselves through social media, where there's quite a lot of evidence that people like views that they agree with and they go into an echo chamber and people on the right follow people on the right and people on the left follow people on the left and there is no bridging and you just need to look at america where you have fox news and msnbc and you get completely different um, stories and facts and takes on things and never the two shall meet so i think it's great in most of europe that we have strong public service broadcasting but there are some challenges one of them is a trust is declining. So if you look at most of the statistics, and you can argue about the way they're calculated, but trust is going down in the public service broadcasters. And impartiality is under siege because you see this alternative news, and then you don't think, why does impartiality matter? And there is clearly also disaffection with the license fee. Um, some of it is political, but it is actually quite hard to explain why you should pay to have a television set or equivalent in 2022. So it's not altogether wrong for there to be some examination of the funding mechanism for the BBC. <clears throat> does the BBC have a problem with impartiality? Well, I, I think it does, but more important, the Director General thinks there is a problem with impartiality. And when Tim Daly, who's a Cambridge alumnus, um, came into uh, the job of Director General, he made impartiality his top priority. And he would say that there is certainly some London bias in the BBC. And I think he implicitly accepts there is some liberal bias in the BBC. And that may be just a legacy of wanting to do the right and good things. But what there has been in recent years is the emergence 
in media of a, a, a different kind of take on journalism, represented probably by the New York Times and The Guardian, which gives you its version of the truth, but it's not necessarily the truth that everybody in the UK would accept. And I, I think very strongly that if you're expecting everybody in the UK to pay for public broadcasting, you have to reflect the voices of everybody in the UK. And it's all jolly well um, us in Cambridge or in North London having a particular worldview, but so do um, nationalists in Scotland, so do UKIP voters in Clapton, um, so do all sorts of people in the Red Wall. So you have to, in a wonderful, diverse, disputatious country, try to reflect that debate and that plurality of views. Now, I think there are some easy prescriptions, if you like. So one of the things is I would very strongly favour more devolution of power to the regions. Um, the, the BBC managed to construct the most important building it ever did in New Broadcasting House with everybody in there, the director of television and radio and the director general and a whole lot. And actually, I would like to hear sometimes that Salford has overruled London or that Glasgow has overruled London. And, 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 and there is a, um, a, a wish that it's not just putting people there, they've got to have the power to broadcast and to reflect the views of, of that, that region. And I think one of the things I, I say in the book is that I think the BBC was slow to see the Brexit tide. And this is not necessarily agreeing with the Brexit tide, it's just being aware that it's there. And there were plenty of people in the BBC working in Lincolnshire or the Northwest who could see this coming and said that to people in London and were generally ignored. That they, they thought, well, no, no, it's, you know, it's not going to be uh, a no vote. And, and if you go back to Boston in Lincolnshire, which is a town that voted most strongly for leave, all the journalists and pundits all turned up in 2016 and said, well, this is obvious why it voted to leave. But they didn't see that in 2013, 14, 15. And if you are a public broadcaster with strong roots across the nation, we should have been better at seeing what was coming. I think then that the knottier problem is if you think that politics from Westminster are broken, which I think quite a lot of us do, um, so probably is political reporting. Mm. And there are lots of people within the Westminster bubble who all live and work and drink with each other and have a very Westminster perspective on the world. And it's not necessarily what's happening in the country. And there was also um, an obsession with process over policy. So voters, and this is not an original mm -hmm. thought, I, I quote a couple of American writers about this, voters care about what? What are you going to do about the health service? What are you going to do about the climate crisis? What are you going to do about the cost of living? Whereas political correspondents generally care more about how. How are you going to get that through the commons? How is Rishi Sunak going to react to Liz Trust doing that? Um, th there's a, there's a, a the thing the political correspondents love absolutely more than anything is a potential of a split or a leadership contest or a leadership challenge. And um, if you think about all the really big things that affect us, energy security, the future of higher education, relationships with China or Russia or the EU, um, those are not really top of the news agenda all the time, unless there is potentially a cabinet split about them, in which case it is. And whatever you think about Partygate, and I think Partygate was a, an enormously serious story and something that should have been covered in some depth, but there was a, a lovely vignette when Boris Johnson went to India um, and did lots of interesting things about British-Indian relations and about potential trade deals and about cooperation on climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And the only thing he was asked about in India was about whether he'd eaten any birthday cake. Um, and, and this kind of legitimate question, but I don't think he was exactly uninterviewed about that in all the rest of the weeks there. And the broadcasting preoccupation with creating a narrative and following it slavishly um, can, I think, be, be at the expense of real examination of the big issues. So I hope that political coverage can try to follow more of a people's agenda than a Westminster agenda, but that's one reason I'm so delighted Sally's doing this, because she knows all about it. And finally, um, the reason we need to get this right is because um, we've been through some very troubled and difficult times recently, uh, but they're going to keep being troubled and difficult. And um, in the UK, there could well be another Scottish referendum, uh, there could be an Irish border poll, and all this pressure of social media versus impartial journalism it's so important that we have somewhere we can go to where you can hear everybody's voice and you can get some analysis of what the facts of the situation are. So I think it's a really serious 
challenge to us to keep public broadcasting strong and well-funded and impartial, precisely because the threats to it currently are so strong. Thank you very much, Roger. Let's, let's pick up a bit of that. Um, what's the difference between e impartiality and balance in the media? Um, and the reason, I, the reason I raise that is, I mean, obviously there was lots of, there was lots of controversy about Brexit covering, cover, coverage by the BBC. I take your point completely, by the way, about the fact it was very Westminster. I have to say, I thought Brexit was gonna happen. And that's because I was talking to Labour MPs coming back from all around the country and they were seeing it on and they were very worried. <laughs> they thought this is not going well, but nobody really wanted to listen to this. And that's where you're right. Um, but I thought, I mean, the Brexit coverage of, by the BBC seemed to me to fall into several traps. Firstly, it was, as you say, obsessed by processology. And I had been for the, the EU coverage had always been obsessed by how is Britain doing when it goes to Brussels or, you know, all of that stuff. Not really any proper analysis of the economic relationship. The balance, however, the balance that demonstrated the impartiality of the BBC was sort of one economist against however many. And I was just saying to Roger as we came in, I was somewhat depressed to turn on the Today programme this morning. Other, he, other people here may have done so. To hear Gerard Lyons on there, as the economist explaining the budget, the, the, the non-budget budget yesterday to us. And I just thought, oh no, we're going there again. And it seemed to me the opportunity to have a really intelligent, detailed analysis of yesterday. Um, you know, where was the BBC economics editor really being given space to take us through some of the issues? And I think there are some fantastic specialist journalists, but somehow they're, the space they're given is smaller and smaller and smaller, um, and it becomes just sort of glib headlines. Um, so, you know, I think, I, think that, I think there needs to be, I suppose part of me is anxious that Tim Davies is saying, impartiality is what matters because I sort of feel if you keep banging on about it is it going to help or is it going to actually make things worse um, and I think that's always a danger it's certainly been a danger in politics in my experience um, but if, if he is going to how is he going to make it real rather than actually shallow I mean, at the heart of that question is impartiality and balance are different. Mm. And there is a, a bit of a trope around at the moment. The BBC thinks balance is, you have some people saying climate change is happening, some people saying it's not. I don't think the BBC has ever really done that or any other major broadcaster. There are occasionally dissenting voices, which is OK. But for the most part, if you look at the coverage by um, a whole range of correspondents, Justin Rowlatt, Roger Harabin, David Shookman, it has all been very emphatically yeah, yeah. that climate change is happening. I think on Brexit, I, I take a two-stage approach. One is that the broadcasters and the media should have been better at understanding what was happening in the UK. And they should not have been so dismissive of the Eurosceptic case. And I, I'm sure we've all had the experience. I had lunch once with a, a, a withdrawalist Tory MP and my BBC colleague, when he went to the loo, my BBC colleague said, God, he's completely mad, you know, why is he... <laughs> and, you know, you have to at least yeah. take views seriously because yep. they then become real. But I think if you do that, you are better able to give a factual account of what's happening. Let me, let me try something here, which is that um, in the European referendum, I would say it was true and defensible that if we left the EU, we would be a bit poorer off or maybe more poorer off, but we were not going to be economically yeah. better yeah. off by leaving the EU. Yeah. I think the overwhelming consensus of the economists was that that was true. However, if you believe that, sovereignty is more important. In that case, you might decide that sovereignty trumps the economic arguments. Um, and I think there was also this, this sort of balance at times was some people say we'd be better off, some people say we'd be worse off. And then equally on sovereignty, some people say we'd be more sovereign, other people say, well, you can't be because you're still in NATO or whatever. And, and, and I think actually there is a truth in there that the, they could have got to more clearly and that would have helped people make a decision. Mm. Do you not think also though that, that in a sense part of, part of it was they never, the BBC didn't even get the layer below that. Because, I mean, one of my firm, firm views about Brexit is that some of it, it wasn't really even about the EU, some of it, or about sovereignty in some ways. It was just, my life is really rubbish and this can't be any worse and therefore here's a, here's a way to vote. And I don't think, I don't think there was, I don't think there was anything like enough analysis about how left behind the gap between hmm. London in particular, but basically metropolitan metropolitan Britain and the rest of the country. Um, and the, the EU was almost, the EU, the EU referendum to me was almost a, a symptom in a sense. It was a, it was a way of demonstrating that, but I'm not sure we ever had that conversation as a country. Yeah, somebody in the BBC said to me that there is a bit of a tendency 
for producers in London or even in Salford or wherever to think, we're now going to take this idea out into the country and ask people what they think. Oh, Vox you know, Pops. Yeah, that's oh. right. We, 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 I ban <laughs> Vox Pops. Um, and we decided that, you know, fly tipping is a really big issue. So we're yeah. going to go to um, Billericay and ask people what they think about fly tipping. And the agenda goes that way around. It doesn't yeah. go from Billericay back, to, back into yeah, London. Yeah. So, so there, there yeah. is, and, and there's a, a, a really good, generous quote from... Um, Robert Peston, mm -hmm. where Peston says that um, he didn't know anybody who was going to vote leave. And he, you know, he prides himself on yep. being a journalist in contact with all sorts of people and getting yep. around the place. But in his circle, he didn't know any leave voters. Now, if you were based mm -hmm. um, in Wisbeach, not very far from here, mm -hmm. you'd know all leave voters, but that didn't kind of connect. Yep. And I think that lack of understanding makes it a lot worse. Mm -hmm. And people didn't realize, mm -hmm. you know, how many voices are left behind did we hear? Mm. And even now, um, yeah. there are some cliches. When you do the Vox Pops, the cliche now, if you do something about Brexit, is you go and find angry people in a chip shop in Bridlington. <laughs> That's right. And, and they're, they're really angry about yeah, Brexit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Seven Oaks voted 54% for yeah, yeah. leave. You know, how often yeah. do you go to Waitrose in Seven Oaks to talk to leave voters? And that's part of the complexity of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. And what about the business about the the the... Chase, chasing the numbers in a sense on news because I mean one of the other things that you cover in, in your book but and I feel very strongly is that the value of the BBC news and indeed other other significant news channels but particularly let's talk about the BBC is is the ability to really analyze and do in-depth work and I constantly feel there's a tendency to, to think well okay we've done 15 minutes of the serious stuff so now let's do some of the lighter stories that everybody will really quite like um and I don't know. Maybe it's me being maybe it's me being a bit puritan. But I kind of think that's not really what I go to the main BBC channel for. Um, but I don't know. You know, it feels to me that's an it's an increasing pressure to prove the BBC is worth the license fee or whatever it is in the future. Well, there's good news and bad news. The, the bad news is that linear television is falling off a cliff in audience figures. So the way that um, the press, the printed press, declined, linear television is now declining very badly. So typically, um, when I was um, in the BBC <laughs> 10 years ago, um, you'd expect five or six million people for a programme at nine o'clock, and you may now get less than a million. So it's, it's really changed. Within that climate, though, news is doing yeah. rather well. Yeah. So, so news, if you looked at, obviously, with Ukraine this year and yeah. then the royal death, but... Yeah. but, but COVID. In, COVID. Uh, was, COVID. Yeah, yeah. But, so the news is often the most popular programme. So mm. looking at the top 20 programmes in the list, sometimes 10 or 11 of them were the evening bulletins or, you know, and it's a question Tim Davey asks, what is the most popular programme yeah. on TV last night? It's quite often the 6.30 regional yeah. and national news. So um, news is doing, is doing quite well. Mm. And I think... If you go to news on a public service broadcasting channel, generally you want serious news and you want to be told what's happening and you want to be given an account of what's happening in the world today. And it's more interesting if it's a bit cleverer and smarter. And if you look at some of the subjects, I mean, we, we, I think we have some students here now, that, that, that for younger audiences, things like what's the future of A-levels, what's the future of higher yeah. education, yeah. am I getting value for my degree, yeah. why is the UCC, you on strike? Those are questions which people will engage with, and it doesn't need to be the kind of cheery pop piece at the end of the programme. Yeah, yeah. How important is news in relation to the whole of the, B of the BBC? Well, I, I would say incredibly important, and I'm not I mean, sure... I mean, I would, and I'm not sure that that's yeah. the view. Well, news people would say news is important, and um, um, David Hare, I quote, because David Hare, the playwright, um, said, you know, the whole BBC is now being taken over by news. It should be about making plays. Mm. And um, you know, <laughs> drama people want more plays. Um, Obviously. I, I mean, if you look at the, the competitive climate, though, um, there's been a bit of a fashion among especially Tory MPs to say, well, look at the Netflix model. Netflix can deliver really wonderful programmes and so can Amazon and they're investing in the UK and they're filming in the UK, all of which is true, but they are not making look east or 10 o'clock news. So for public broadcasting, news becomes its defining point. And if you look at when people say in the past 12 months, this has been worth the licence fee alone. It has generally been for um, communal events that, you know, women's football, um, the royal obituaries. Um, those are the things which define the public broadcaster. Yeah. So I think trying to be objective, I think that news is ultimately the rationale for the BBC. Though, of course, it needs to have a, an investment in British comedy and drama and other content which the market wouldn't or couldn't make. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Let me ask you another, a, a, a different question. Um, I was, I'm sure like many people, was pretty struck during the recent uh, Tory leadership um, selection, election, whatever it was, um, about the lack of really significant interviews. I mean, particularly the candidate who ended up winning. And uh, I mean, I am, I'm very concerned by that because I, I think there is a real place for not, ag not aggressive, but really detailed scrutiny of leading politicians of all parties. Um, and if I think back, you know, pretty my, many, many years ago, um, I mean, the big interviews were A, utterly essential. You weren't allowed, there was no way you could say no. And B, my goodness, they were serious. And the level of preparation was intense because they were, I mean, a level of ordeal, but an important ordeal to get through. And they were an hour. Um, I mean, they were really serious. I and mean, I can remember in Iraq, you know, the, the crucial Iraq interview had to be done. It absolutely had to be done. Um, I am really disturbed by the fact now that, that, that we, we're not finding the space and we're not, how do we, I mean, if people agree with me, how do we raise the expectation and demand that people still are put through serious questioning rather than rather glib sort of interviews that always seem to be on a balcony with the sunshine somewhere? You're, you're, you're right. Um, I, I'd say, before I say something very positive about Tony Blair, I'll say something minor, a minor negative, which is that That's fine. <laughs> New Labour did, of course, invent some of the techniques of spin and representation. <laughs> Um, and at times were incredibly difficult to deal with, yes. um, especially yeah. in, in that period just up to yeah, the yeah, yeah. election. There was a lot at yeah. stake. Yeah. However, you're also right that um, uh, Tony Blair did, I think, three 45-minute interviews with Jeremy Paxman on Newsnight, mm -hmm. and also just before the Iraq war um, in Newcastle, and I went up to that programme, mm -hmm. um, he did, remember, there was something called the masochism strategy. Yeah, I was part of that, yeah. That, he, of, he, of putting himself, and, and the audience was... He used to say, Who's, whose idea is this? <laughs> <laughs> and you're not the people having to do this. And you said it's a really good idea. Yeah, but, yeah. but the, the masochism <laughs> strategy was that the audience in Newcastle was deliberately chosen all to be critics of the Iraq yeah, war. They were. So we didn't choose any people who yeah. were pro-Iraq war. No, they it was were all to take the argument on. And, yeah. and Blair yeah. in the Sage Centre in Gateshead took on an audience of 100 people mm. and was very impressive. Mm. And they were talking to them afterwards. They were very impressed by him. It didn't mean they agreed with him. No. It didn't mean no. they changed their mind. But there was accountability there. Yeah. And it's just I, the accountability issue, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. some people, some people will do it, but Boris Johnson was utterly evasive about interviews. Mm -hmm. um, Liz Truss has so far shown herself to be in the same mode, mm -hmm. and um, I think the broadcasters should start going back to the idea there is um, a, a series or a, a, an expectation of a, a panorama type interview mm -hmm. in the peak schedule in which people are held to account. And if this trust won't do it, well, Kwasi Kwarteng should be asked to do it, and if he won't yes. do it. And, and, and there has to be that brought back, that yes. there will be a cool, calm... And, and to, in fairness to, to this trust, she did do the Laura Kunzberg show the day before she got elected, but there needs to be more of it. <laughs> and that wasn't that tough, I wouldn't say, really. No. Um, you know, I mean, my, my first experience of Laura, many, 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 many years ago, I think it was, I can't remember, Pre-97, maybe. I don't know. I don't know when it was. It was the Richmond Theatre. I was asked, so it's back to your processology point, actually. It was the, all the sort of drama point. It, it was the Richmond Theatre, and I sat in the Richmond Theatre while we talked about the, the conference speech as a dramatic event. So that she wasn't remotely... I said, but, you know, this is... This will be an hour and there'll be, I can tell you, six pages of policy. And she said, oh, well, we won't be interested in that very much. And, and that was always wearing, from the other side, in a sense, talking to Roger, um, I think I think where where what's interesting is I don't think the media and politicians have have necessarily understood that we but in many ways perhaps not the current lot but in many ways people are concerned about the same thing so we used to say oh no the BBC are going to get into processology again um, how do we get them to be interested in policy and you meanwhile were saying oh you know they're not taking this seriously so. I think there's more common interests about trying to have a serious conversation than perhaps some of us realised then, then. I don't know whether that's the case now. Let me ask you the question, though. When, when you were in Downing <laughs> Street, um, you know, on some accounts, essentially running Downing Street, um, you had the whole Tony Blair, Gordon Brown soap opera going on. Yeah. So to what extent were you conscious that almost everything you announced or discussed was going to be seen through that prism? I mean, I think that's fair. I think it, it was an increasing problem. I think in the first term... Not really. Um, I think post 2001, yes. Um, and it was partly, I think, not Tony and Gordon, but it was advisors, and I put myself in this category, that, that 
we'd go out and we'd we'd brief our side of the story too much um and it became a growing it definitely became a growing issue because you know gordon was gordon was seeking the next stage so i think it did become a growing issue but i do think it was at times overplayed because what wasn't recognized is at times strange to to remember it now but it was a kind of at times quite a healthy um debate because he was gordon was bringing in a marginally different view and i think back now quite a marginally different viewpoint at times um and they often hammered it out for two hours together without any of the rest of us there and i think probably that was part of the problem so i think it's true i think i think we i think politicians produce the, the stuff that means the media can go that way but we collectively somehow have got to fight back against it i think yeah and it's not saying that i mean clearly brown v blair was a story nobody's saying yeah, it yeah. wasn't a story but when you're trying to reform um education or the health service yeah. those are the things that matter more to people yes. and you know you, you yes. had what how many five six years of blair brown tensions yep. and it went nowhere until finally it does become really important yeah yeah no i think that's fair i think that's fair i think that's fair but i think but i think the and maybe that was partly our fault. Maybe the, the, the core issues of reform were really, really important. And actually 90% of it was agreed. And probably because of that, it didn't come over. And of course, there wasn't any great incentive for broadcasters to get into that in any great detail because the other stuff was more fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is a problem. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how we, I, I also think the sort of processology stuff was quite significant around Brexit too. Um, and I think if we're not careful, it will be around the coming period and I think somehow somehow we've got to try and engage the public if you like in 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 demanding something different yeah I mean the, the best example of process during the Brexit referendum was um, you may remember Theresa May was a bit elusive during the Brexit referendum yes. didn't appear very much and there have been some suggestions she might have been leaning towards leave and she finally decides to do an interview as Home Secretary and say that she is going to be in favour of Remain and of course, the big issue in the Brexit campaign at one point was, well, throughout, was immigration. And she's the person in charge of immigration. So there's a five minute interview, which you can still see on the BBC website, in which she's asked one question or maybe two about immigration. And she says, well, it's not a magic bullet leaving the EU, which is something I think you could have interrogated a yeah. bit more, um, yeah. but yeah. they didn't. Yeah. And then they go for three minutes about, is she going to run for leader if David Cameron um, gets defeated? Um, you know, if, if Cameron goes, will you stand? Now, first of all, it's quite a boring question to most people in the country who care more about immigration than they do about, um, you know, whether Theresa May is going to stand. And also, she is never going to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, the only answer that is interesting is if she says, OK, yeah, yeah. Dave, if Dave loses, I'm going to run yeah. the campaign begins now. <laughs> and she's probably not going to say that. Probably not. Um, no. And, you know, that's questioned over and over again. And Theresa May actually says in that interview that I can't win on this because if I say um, yeah, yes, um, obviously you're then going to make a story. And if I say no, you're then going to play it against me if I do. And, and you know, politicians understand that context. Yeah. And it must be frustrating for them yeah. as well as for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I should say, in, I, I have commissioned that kind of interview myself multiple times because <laughs> you kind of think, you know, see if we can get her to say what we're. No, happening. of course, yeah. no, no. Well, I mean, I have to say, from my side, you'd say what they're going to be after is X, so that's what you must give them. I mean, because because yeah. it's the get, you know, it, that's one of the problems is there is a game to an extent where people know, oh, that's the question they're really going to be after, and you know, there's been a few, there's been a few um, people I think have been really brilliant at. Uh, sort of getting around that. I, I mean, Eddie Mayer, I remember Eddie Mayer yeah. was, was always pretty good at suddenly springing something and nobody was prepared for it. But there aren't many. It's where you get the, the, the challenge for the country then is that nobody really examines um, future pandemic That's planning. Right. That's right. And, um, you know, in the US, right. um, flood defences in New Orleans, all those stories are not there because we're too much focused on the what's going to happen in Congress or Parliament next week and not at all about the things which will guarantee our long term security. What about Ukraine? Because I, I mean, I think it's interesting what you say about the big, the you know, the big proper analysis. Are we? Is the BBC becoming not exactly jingoistic, but is it? Is it? Is it following the story in a particular way and not looking at the big macro political issues around around Ukraine sufficiently, thinking about what's going to happen in the next six months, year, two years, five years? Yeah, and I, I think that the reporting of foreign stories is generally very good. Mm. Um, yeah, they're yeah. brave correspondents who Absolutely. put themselves at Absolutely. risk, and they do uh, a very, very good job indeed. Um, I think you can say that probably 
um, like the political establishment, the media were a bit slow on spotting. I mean, you can hardly miss what happened with Putin in 2008 mm. and 2014 mm -hmm. and poisoning people in the UK in 2018. Mm. And um, yet the we Today Programme... join it up somehow, did we? Yeah, the Today yeah. Programme probably didn't run any items saying we should invest more in um, tanks and um, uh, you know, just keep an eye on Russia. So we were focused on, on, on the wrong things. Um, I, I think that there have been... Um, uh, uh, you know, problems in some of the coverage that um, too much of it felt like it was about the human stories, which are very powerful, and sometimes not quite enough about what's happening in the war. So I think certainly in the early days, you had this expectation that Kiev was going to fall and that the correspondents were basically done that. And they kept saying, you know, tanks are 15 miles away from Kiev and didn't say um, they're stuck in the mud and frozen and there are supply lines and Russian conscripts are a real problem. So I, th 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 there have been ones who... Um, Phase in big picture there, but I would salute most of the fun. Oh, I think the coverage, don't get me wrong, I, I, I think the coverage is, is amazing and I think the reporters are amazing. I suppose a bit of me is starting to yearn for where is the serious analysis um, from somebody who's slightly stepping back about, well, exactly where is NATO going on this and what happens if X happens or Y happens? which we haven't got even that much in the print media. Um, and I think it won't, I mean, I think it's become weaker on, in print as well, actually, in international yeah. proper analysis rather than amazing reporting. I completely agree with you. Yes, yeah, so the BBC did at one point fairly recently think about abolishing the post of defence correspondent. Right. Which um, probably wasn't a good idea. Yeah, no, I think I think that's I think that's fair. What about the balance between I was really intrigued. I didn't know anything about it until until I read about it in the book. The balance between production and news gathering. Um, and I thought you were arguing fairly strongly that we do still need real centers of excellence, that you need programming to be different. And there's a move towards the efficiency of more of it coming together, which has been the model in, in, in other companies, I guess. Where's, where, where's it going on that? And where's, where, where's, what's your view on that? And what, what's, the, you know, what's the right balance, I guess? Well, this is a bit of the under the bonnet yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the BBC, over most of its 100 years of existence, has thrived on strong editors who will make decisions about their programme and do rather iconoclastic and um, exciting and different programmes. And the pressure of costs, which I completely understand, has mean that that has gone to a much more centralised system. And therefore, one or two people are making decisions for all the output in a way that in the olden days, there would have been olden days, there would have been, um, you know, 20 disputatious argumentative editors making different decisions. And probably the best example of this is um, the interview with Djokovic about vaccine, mm -hmm. um, which um, I think some editors might have thought, uh, they would really think that's an amazing scoop, which it was, and run it. Some would think, hang on, are we giving a platform to a vaccine sceptic, and do we really want to do that? And if so, I'm going to put it in a critical context. And some people would say, well, it's been on the Today programme and on television news, I'm not going to put it on Newsnight. Whereas now, there's much more of a central urge to put the same thing on all the outlets. And um, to, slightly to my shame, when I was editor of TV News, um, sometimes a six and ten would go in different directions. They had different editors. They would take a different view. But that actually gave you a plurality of yes. voice. Yes. Whereas if you watch them now, they are virtually identical. And, and all the stuff is the same. You can hear things on the stage programme in the morning mm. and on TV news in the evening, which we would regard as absolute horror. You know, they're doing mm. the same as us. You can hear it twice on the same programme in some cases, yeah. the Today yeah. programme. I mean, and I think, I think you're Tim, up long enough. Yeah, that's right. I think Tim Davey is, is aware of that. And, and, it, and uh, you know... It, we were inefficient, and at times it was very hard being in a newsroom when you had different editors pulling in different directions. Now it's too monolithic and there's too much of a, um, a single view. Um, and I think you can get much more texture into the programme, so that's a big challenge, um, because people want exciting, interesting broadcasting. So how does that fit with your plea for more of it to be taken outside London and more to have more regional coverage and more serious jobs, I guess, as well outside? I mean, I, I met... I met um, the BBC sports editor um, last week when I was in Manchester. Who is a Fitzwilliam alumnus. Who is a Fitzwilliam alumnus. <laughs> um, and uh, he said to me, and I believe him, I mean, you may, you may know it's, whether it's true or not, he said to me he thought he was, the, he was one of the 12 editors, the only one of the 12 editors who actually moved to the Northwest to Salford. Now, obviously, BBC sports has moved there. Um, I didn't get the feeling from him there was any great push for 
a real movement of lots of the lots of lots of other serious top level jobs. And I have to say, it's my same view of, of kind of you know, you move the. I think we disagree on this, but you move the treasury notionally to Doncaster or wherever it's going. But actually, the serious jobs will still be in Whitehall. It's what happened with British manufacturing in the the eighties. You know, um, so so I'm I sort of how real how real is this sort of uh, spoken desire to move to move things outside London? Well, uh, not very secret is a number of people based in Manchester uh, still live in London and um, commute. Trains right? aren't working at the well are very well. Yeah, yeah I, I came problematic. across, I, and, and it can be ludicrous. I came across one presenter when I was going home one night down Oxford Street. I came across a presenter who was nominally based in Manchester, who had just come back from his commute to Manchester, in which he'd interviewed people who were in London. You know, it's kind yeah, of yeah. Um, um, yeah. But I think the structural thing, which is a problem, is that um, I, I know some people who present programmes from Manchester or edit programmes from Salford, Greater Manchester, um, and they do do the programmes from Salford, but they're ultimate editor is in London yeah. and the head of BBC content is in London yeah. and the DG's in London. Yes, and exactly. That, exactly. That's right. So the commissioning is still too much in, mm. in London. Um, and they are doing really good things to try to make, make yeah. that better. They've got to take the confidence that someone in the nations and regions is going to overrule them and say that's a different perspective and yeah. what we think. I'm going to throw it open to, to questions both from the floor, but also um, from people who are watching online. And we've, I gather we've got a roving mic. So... Here's the roving mic. Lady here, first of all. Hang on, just get, we'll just wait for the mic. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. I've got two, two questions, really. Um, one, we just um, got the television out again after, um, fifth, um, for, for Brexit, for Brexit and isolation and pandemic, and um, it's been in the lot for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Radio 4. It's not that I'm not interested mm. in the news, obviously. Um, the first thing is the news issue. I have a feeling that the BBC nowadays, coming back into the slot, is a little fearful of government legislation and government approval for what it's broadcasting. It's worried that there's an attacker out there. And that is very important. Can I stop you? I'm going to stop you there because I think there's so many people with hands up. I'll take one question from you if that's well, can okay. I just quickly say that. The, um, there's an over-reliance on people like David Attenborough for the rest, mostly cookery programmes, auctions, distance travel. There's no... <laughs> Homes, yes. You have to go to iPlayer. Thank you very and much. I think that yeah. the BBC of the past, which had gripping drama, I'm interested in opera, drama, anything intellectual, intellectual debates, we don't have them. I mean, it's changed completely. Roger. Yeah, I, I mean, I did a, a webinar for Selwyn with um, Tim Davey about 18 months ago in which I teased him about the fact that he'd said, we want to have really distinctive programmes that are the envy of the world. And I said to him, here's your Saturday night schedule, which has four celebrity game shows, one after another. And his defence, which is a good one, is that they do need to pr produce programmes for a broad and general audience. But I think they have to be careful they don't lose the things that are on BBC Two and BBC Four and the great things on radio. And I think they are conscious of that. Um, and it's at the moment there, uh, you know, there's no doubt they have to at times go for cheaper cookery and property programmes because that's what will get a daytime audience. My longer term idea would be that if the iPlayer really takes over, you don't need to do those daytime schedules yeah. and commission, um, you know, stuff that can be on any other channel. And the BBC can be more distinctive in a, by doing fewer, bigger, better. Yeah. And I guess part of the point about your news actually is that increasingly younger people aren't, they're not watching the six o'clock and the 10 o'clock, but they are getting their news from the BBC in a different oh, way. Oh yeah, yeah. And I mean, I the, one, the one good thing about social media yeah. and digital is that it's an established news brands are quite strong there. Yeah. And the BBC in the past year went on to TikTok and yeah. Sky have a very big audience on TikTok. And I um, mean, you know, that's good that you're getting proper stuff into yeah. digital space. Gentlemen, the blue jumper, and then the gentleman down here, and then I, I, I will take other people. Yeah, blue jumper. Has BBC got a future? Has BBC got a future? Well, I really hope so. And, and I thought that um, the new 
Culture Secretary the other day when she was praising the BBC's um, royal coverage, um, did say that the BBC was indispensable on those kind of occasions. But you have to fund it properly if you're going to make it so. You can't just expect you can press a button and suddenly there'll be 200 cameras available for a big national event if you don't fund it all the time. I think, I think enough people in government do get, do get that. And, you know, the one thing I would say about the BBC is that um, over 100 years, there have been incredible threats and um, existential crises and losing DGs. And somehow the BBC always survives and, and you, know, you know, used to come through even slightly bigger sometimes. So I, I think the survivability of the BBC, I hope, is there. But it's going to need to reform and also have a sensible dialogue with government. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so uh, my kind of historical recollection of public service broadcasting was that it's there to educate and communicate the views of experts to people so they can form a balanced view. But experts have got much harder to recognize. Um, many of them have kind of prostituted their integrity with mm -hmm. you know, one way or another. So um, what I, I don't really understand is how the extent to which you see public service broadcasting as um, promoting the right view, and if so, who defines the right view with the, the subtext of your conversation about Brexit seemed to be that it was a bad thing and it would have been better if the BBC had persuaded people it shouldn't happen. But I mean, is that right? Is that something they should do or, or not? No, no. and, and, and I, I, I think what I said, and certainly what I wrote is that um, I think being clearer about the economic side, and there's nothing to stop people saying, you know, 95 economists think this, this one person um, thinks the other. You can do that. So I think you can be clear about that. But, but that's what I was saying about the debate between sovereignty and the economic side, is that ultimately people have to make their choice on that. And one of my friends who's Brexiteer said, you know, if he and his wife had to eat nettles for the rest of their life, he'd still have voted for Brexit. And it's a, it's a view. I don't think the BBC should tell you which way to vote, but it should give you as much information as it can based on the best impartial evidence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm taking two people up here now for a change, so um, lady up there and then gentleman with the beard. Oh. Um, so my question is about um, the particular broadcast response to the COVID pandemic and the lack of challenge to the orthodoxy that lockdown and only lockdown was the right way to go, because uh, now you are beginning to see some more conversation around the mental health consequences of lockdown, economic consequences of lockdown, and the health consequences of only treating COVID in our hospitals. And the education gap. And the education mm. gap, and, mm. and the massive damage to, to, to those that are sort of poor off. Why was it that there was no challenge at all from the broadcast media and very, very little from the print media to the orthodoxy of lockdown? I, I, I think that's a very fair question. I, I suppose I, I've talked to um, some of our Cambridge medical experts about this. I think most people would still agree that the very first lockdown was probably necessary, but maybe not for as long as it should be. However, what you see later on in the uh, pandemic is, again, the obsession with process. Think about how many times people speculated about should Gavin Williamson be sacked or not? And that was quite that... easy, actually. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> but how, how much did you get school closures as a real examination <laughs> yeah. of the benefits of stopping for the pandemic versus the damage to yeah. children? And, and that was not really looked at in any oh, sort of depth. Yeah. And I thought that was a, one of the low points for political yeah. correspondents who would be swayed by whatever the mood in Westminster was, yeah. shut all the schools or yeah, open all the schools. Yeah. And they should have looked much more at the evidence of what the balance of benefits and losses would be. So I, I do agree with you. Yeah. So why um, I think it didn't happen in the early days because um, there was a national emergency. We were frightened. I think there was a, an obvious public service interest in trying to get the information to people to keep them safe and keep the NHS going. I think after that, process came in and, mm. and the political correspondents were the worst people mm. to guide us through some aspects of the pandemic. And I always felt much better when it was a health correspondent or a science correspondent. And I think there was, I think there was also, um, the, the broadcasters were a bit late in spotting some of the problems with the vaccine and some of the issues that came up. And I think if you had mm. more independent, diverse editors, I would certainly on the World at One have been doing that story yeah, yeah. about, you know, <laughs> are vaccines absolutely yeah. safe? Yeah. In the context, I think that overall vaccines were an immensely good thing. But you need to challenge all aspects of what you're being told. And at times it wasn't done enough. I, I mean, I think some of the health editors 
were more thoughtful and were given were given a bit more space than normal actually weren't they but yeah. but the press conferences where each of the political editors from the main four came along with their question they were going to ask regardless of what they'd heard before and that that's what would appear on the media that night was was a pretty as you say was a pretty low point i think in terms of us learning as a country what was going on gentlemen uh, Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, this question is probably going to hit on the last two uh, pretty well, and you can tell by my accent where I'm coming from. What is the role of sort of public broadcasting in identifying deliberate uh, disinformation or misinformation? And if it's not public service broadcasting's role, where, where do you see that? Thank you. Good question. It, it's, it's a very good question, and, and it's been an active um, debate. And in fact, when um, we, we had a a dinner at the BBC a couple of weeks ago um, uh, where we were talking about exactly this. How do you fact check in real time? Because what you tend to find is that um, someone will make a speech and then a day later there'll be something on reality check on the website yeah. which says, well, that actually is not right. And I think arming presenters with the information they need and being able to call out factual errors or challenges. So, for instance, when um, Johnson used to say all the time, um, 40 new hospitals, um, you know, there, there is an easy bit of research template that says exactly what's going on there. But it is difficult. And I think you've got to be careful. That I think some of that comes from a Trump and Johnson are always telling lies. And you would want, for instance, challenge Nick Clegg on tuition fees. And, you know, they're, they're, they're all politicians from all sides yeah, yeah. do have things that they say. But I think there is a definite mood within the BBC and the other broadcasters to get more real-time fact-checking and to call out things which are simply not true. And I think that's a... That There's a confidence right. thing as well, isn't there? Because in a sense, the, the you know, you remember that 350, 3, 350 million on the bus thing. Um, there was more confidence in some of the other channels than the BBC in, yeah, in yeah. terms of challenging that. I yeah, think. It's, it's one of the... It's it, so obviously... Yeah, the, the, the best deconstruction of that was Tom Bradby with Boris Johnson on ITV News... Um, on the bus where Tom said over and over again, this isn't true, you're telling a lie. And the BBC does not have an equivalent piece of footage from 2016 in which one of its correspondents did yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Lady in purple and then over here and then there. Um, I, when you talk um, about people in Salford just sort of rushing up, doing the news and coming back, is there any... I wonder about local news. I wonder how much respect there is for local radio channels and local news in the BBC. It always feels it's a bit like a slightly condescending pat on the head. And here's so and so from Birmingham. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, and the whole Brexit thing, for instance, in Hereford, there was it was so deeply embedded, all the local issues, they never came up. Is, has the BBC got any interest in local or any respect for local news? Well, it has a big investment in local and regional news. Um, having said that, you may have seen that the Cambridge programme we currently get here um, is going to be lost um, later this year and will become a programme from Norwich again. So, so some cuts are affecting it. But I think the BBC should take its nations and regions very seriously indeed and, and as I say, empower them. Um, and it's not just a little nice local opt. Mm. It's something that a lot of people watch and is vital for local democracy. And mm. local papers have largely gone. Mm. So if the BBC isn't doing it, mm. who is? I must say, as somebody who originally came from Liverpool, sort of BBC Merseyside was very, very powerful. And mm. I think still is. And it would be a real loss if, yeah. if, it, if, it, yeah. if it got reduced. That's radio rather than television. Yeah. But, yeah. Gentlemen here and here. Could I... Um bring us back to the two words at the end of the title, digital disruption. Um, if it is the case that younger people are getting more of their news from social media, is that a concern? And is there any possibility, even at this late stage, of some sort of concept of public service social media? Um, I, I think public service social media would be difficult. I mean, they, the broadcasters do put their content on social media. What I'm reassured about, um, um, we have some sewing students um, here, that uh, when I say to um, uh, events I do, does anyone read a printed newspaper? They think you've gone mad and nobody will read a printed newspaper. Um, if you say, do you watch the 10 o'clock news? Again, that's pretty, um, mm. a very minority. A wild, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you check the BBC or public service yes. media to find out if a story is true yes. or not? Um, yes, overwhelmingly yes. people do, and people use BBC Online and Sky News Online and Washington Post Online. So that's good, and you've got to make sure that that remains there and that the habit of trying to check stories is right. But you've seen in the past um, um, couple of weeks in Leicester, the disturbances mm. in Leicester appear to be fueled by 
very distorted accounts on social media. Yeah. And that's where it's really important that you have a broadcasting service that people of all ages and ethnicities and backgrounds can go to to find out what's really happening. So it's, it's hanging on by the skin of its mm. teeth in some areas. But the, the importance of it, I think, is proven when you see what can happen if you lose it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, my question actually links to that really nicely. So um, I uh, often get quite frustrated by the presentation or um, the, 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 the way that the stories regarding young people are dealt with in like the BBC. So it's always, um, oh, here's a young person's story. You know, it might be A-level results day or something like that, but, it, but it's never, oh, we're going to talk about the cost of living crisis. Let's talk to a young person. Yes. It's always, the conversations are always about pensions and things like that. There's, uh, there's no voice in those sorts of stories. So my question really is, is that a cause of um, uh, young people moving to social media? And so the BBC yeah. playing into their target audience of older people, or is that the consequence of uh, young people moving away to mm. other sources of... Oh, look, I, I think that's a very good point. And, and the fact is that news desks have to find stories at very short notice and get out and get to, um, um, you know, particular people on a particular story. And therefore, in a way, the, those vox pops fit the story rather than being really listening to the people there. And I think there's a concept which may sound a bit idealistic that in a perfect world, broadcasters and national media would be in a hot air balloon floating over the UK in which they hear all the voices coming out of um, the UK and synthesise them and try to find truth and accuracy and marry them with the events of the world. And it's, it's, it's idealistic, but I think certainly the sort of crash bang, let's find a young person and they, we want them to say this is not a good way of representing sections of society. Yes. I was wondering on, on the comment about media being focused on the short term in democratic countries. I was wondering if climate change in, is an exception to that because there is quite a lot of coverage these days in the BBC about reports um, by organizations like the IPCC on climate change. Um, and I was wondering about whether there's a bit of a gap in medium term crises like the rise of China, because way back in 2005, mm -hmm. prominent Chicago academic John Mersheimer wrote an article why China cannot rise peacefully. In 2017, Rand was doing studies on scenarios for US-China conflict and how the effects of that world trade would put the recession and COVID economic crises into, in, into real proportion. And I was wondering if that might be a bit of a lacuna at the moment, um, uh, given that the rise of China is uh, such a, a world-shattering significant mm. event. Mm which kind of links to what we were talking about in terms of Russia and Ukraine, actually, in a way, yeah. Um, it's a very good point, Evan. Yeah. Um, you also have to be aware of the narrative. The narrative is that um, broadcasters, for all sorts of understandable reasons, get a story in their agenda, and then they cover it obsessively and all the time. And climate change is the most important thing facing us, probably. But, uh, you know, when the BBC said we're going to do climate change yeah. week, yeah. well, yeah. I think we probably yeah. know about climate yeah. change. What about skills and training week, yeah, yeah. which yeah. might seem like a tough agenda, but is very, very important yeah. to the country? How, yeah. you know, how do we address the productivity gap in the UK? Yeah. I can't remember anything much on peak time about that. Well, that was my concern with the the analysis of the budget. Actually, yeah. I was just thinking, where is the where is the really serious, detailed work about how this will drive? It's going to drive growth. How? Where? You know, what's the mechanism? It's not there at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes, yeah. and then and then, gentlemen in the green jumper. Roger, just drawing some of the threads together, one of my concerns is about pusillanimity at the BBC, maybe. We have Liz Truss not doing interviews, threats to funding, uh, many threats to funding always, uh, a, a description of impartiality as impartiality or balance, whereas actually due impartiality, i.e. the proper... Uh, distinction between different issues and, and the balance of, of, of conversation. And then we have a DG who has not got a journalism background, has been very down on quite a lot of presenters, many of whom, and many of whom are the most experienced ones, have left recently. And the most experienced people who have actually <clears throat> put their politicians through their paces. Oh. Are you worried that in this current climate, um, the threats to the independence, but more the uh, vibrancy of the BBC's 
desire to question and hold the government to account is under more threat than normal. Well, Sarah, I, I, I agree. I think there are terrible threats to the BBC and um, Nadine Doris encapsulated quite a few of them. By, I mean, she said at one point, it was brief to the papers, uh, that question by Nick Robinson has made the licence the settlement tougher. Yes, and that is unforgivable. You, you cannot and should not do that. But, of course, the thing that's tricky, and it actually is the lady's question there too, is that sometimes two things can be true, which is the BBC is under threat and there's improper interference sometimes, yes. But... Was Emily make this as monologue impartial about Dominic Cummings? And would you as an editor, would I as an editor, let it through? No, I wouldn't. I, I, I think it, she should have changed four or five words in it. It would have been OK. But it was not impartial. So therefore, you have the people worrying about threats to the BBC. And then when the BBC says, actually, make this didn't get it right, you then get a lot of political spin about, well, that's because the BBC is cowardly and frightened. Whereas in that case, I think they were simply doing what was right. I would like, we are getting very tight, but I can still see some. I'll, t I'll t try and squeeze a few in. Yeah. I would like just to observe that we seem to be looking at our navels a little bit, in that all of this conversation has been entirely about domestic production and domestic information. I live in Switzerland, and I'm, among other things, very surprised by the number of different BBC channels that exist, both uh, television and, and in radio. But I would say that in the world as a whole, the BBC World Service is what it claims to be, the leading source of real and relatively impartial news, uh, which is uh, considered and valued by people right around the world. And that should not be lost. And it is an important and has to be a public service. I, I think that's right. And the soft power of the BBC World Service and world news and online is uh, enormous. And I think there are now something like 500 million users of the BBC worldwide, which is great. Yes. Just a quick question from me. I'm really interested in dis digital disruption. Um, I was just wondering where there is disruption, there is always opportunity. So where do you see the opportunities lie for, um, for this kind of service? I, I think part of it is, um, awareness of media and and the ability to challenge what you're reading and listening to so critical awareness and i think that there's no point in saying we don't want a digital tide to happening or it's, because it is happening but when you see stories you see that ability to um spot the fakes realize where find a source where the truth might lie um, and if you imagine that there was no BBC or no public broadcasting in European countries, um, a huge amount of that ability to keep a spine of truth and accuracy would go. So you have to accept the disruption, but hope that through that, truth and facts and the actual evidence of, of stories is going to be is going to be present. Gentlemen, there and then lady, here, and it, that's it. Then yes, yes, that's very very short, please. <laughs> Just to reassure people that uh, moving from London's working, my sister's house price in Manchester's doubled due to the presence of the senior BBC. They've got a great, people. a great life up there, in my view. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned that stories go away. Like, I'm sure Putin's Putin knows that British politicians are driven by the media. The BBC's just about stopped reporting on Ukraine when the war. First started, you saw the BBC seems to have got bored with the Ukraine. It's hardly on them. I, I think there's a duty to keep um, publicising it so people keep supporting anti-Putin. Do you think there's a problem with us dropping off coverage on things that go on for a long time? Can, can you remind, remember that? I'm yeah. just going to take the lady there and you can answer the final two questions together. Thank you. No, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. That's the final one, yeah. Hi, I've got... Young children, well, children in their 20s, and they don't particularly want to watch the news. And one of the reasons, they do read it, like you say, on their digital media. One of the reasons is they find it incredibly depressing. <laughs> that The news is always about issues that they find from their mental health point of view is just makes them feel low. And I just wonder whether there is ever any intention to seek out some, you know, what is news? And there are things going on in the world and there are new discoveries and relating to climate change, there's some progressive things. 
when do you ever think about specifically looking for some issues that actually might raise people's uh, moods and, and put them and make them think of some things that are actually happening in the world that aren't the political issues that get hammered again and again from the politicians? It's a, it's a good question and linking with yeah. the previous one. Coming back to stories is a good idea. So if you look at uh, probably three, four weeks ago, we were obsessed by just how high the gas prices were going. And gas prices, I think, have fallen by about 30% in the last couple of weeks, which hasn't really been reported. Yeah. And, and I think staying with the story and telling you, you know, we had all the stuff about supply chains, we're not going to have any turkeys for Christmas. And then we sort of did. And, yeah. and I think <laughs> the, 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 ability, the ability to tell people what happened on yeah. the story we were preoccupied by, very good yeah, idea, yeah. there should be more of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I thank you very much indeed, all of you, for, for that really active involvement. I want to finish with, a, I thought, a fantastic quote in Roger's book, actually, that the sweet spot for news is journalism that is evidenced and impartial, but that says something of significance too. So I think that's our, that's what we're aiming for. Um, but I do think we've got a responsibility together to try and keep pushing for that. So, Roger, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.